We are in a really awesome sermon series called Best Sermon Ever, and I don't want you to think that uh, we believe we've got a peg on what makes a really good sermon. Um, that's not us. Uh, we believe that Jesus is the one who preached the best sermon ever. So we are um, going through this sermon, and we are applying it to our lives. And this week, we happen to be um, in chapter 5, verses 27 through 32, and upon looking at just the different things going on in that passage of Scripture, um, you know, when, when you're a pastor, you sit down and you try to find the, the ways that all these kinds of things connect and how they correlate with one another. And whenever I, whenever I was looking at it, I, I was thinking, you know, there, there are so many ways that we have blurred lines in different places. And so the, the title of the sermon, um, because of that, is Blurred Lines. So you can have fun with this. Um, and so, so we have this misconception that, um, that there is a line between right and wrong, right? Right? We, we have this misconception there's a line between right and wrong. We think that's also the same line between sinner and saint, right? We think that, um, we, think that we either have to move to the good side for God to have favor on us, or we, or we have to move the line over so that we're on the good side, we think that we have to do that in order to earn God's favor. Uh, but I have, I have some news, if you haven't heard this before. We're not able to move from one side of the line to the other because the scriptures say that we always sin. For all have sinned and fall short, present tense, fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. It doesn't say unless you have done this, this, or this. We can't move to the right side of that line. So what do we do? We try to move the line over. We try to say, well, that isn't actually sin. That isn't actually wrong. We, we try to justify it in our minds, right? But guess what? We can't do that either because that line is a very rigid line that God has established through his scriptures, through his word. So we can't, we don't have the authority to move that line. We don't have even the mental capacity to change a definition of what God calls sin. So since we can't move to the other side of the line, and we can't move the line to make us on the good side, well, we're in a ter terrible position, aren't we? We have an immovable line, and listen, only Jesus can move us from the sinner side of the line to the saint side of the line, okay? So all this to kind of set up Matthew 5, uh, 27 through 32, um, so, so we see ourselves, and we see how we try to do that, but guess what? The Pharisees, surprise, the Pharisees did this very often. They did this very same thing with all of the law. They, they knew the law, but they still tried to change it to make it um, say what they wanted it to say. And so Jesus, whenever he noticed that this was going on, whenever he's teaching his disciples and whenever he knows that Pharisees are present, Jesus wants to shatter these misconceptions. So uh, we're going to read. Um, if, you, if you have a Bible or an app, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 5. and We're going to start in verse 27. Uh, but first I'm going to pray. Jesus, you're so good. You are uh, the best teacher. You're the best preacher. And God, if I were to ever think that I could come anywhere close to being the teacher that you are, God, I would be stricken down. God, you have said that you, you humble the exalted and you exalt the humble. So God, I pray that this morning um, I would be able to approach this from a position of humility, knowing that these teachings that you have handed to us have pierced me to the heart. And God, I pray that you would help me to share my conviction with this church. But God, I pray most of all that God, you would just get me out of the way. God, that you would speak what you want to have said here today. God, I pray that I would not be in the way at all. And God, I pray that our hardened hearts would not be in the way of what you would have to say to us. God, everyone with an ear to hear let us hear what you have said to us. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for your word. These things we ask are in the name of Jesus. Amen. So church, let's read uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 27. <clears throat> 
says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So see, Jesus addresses a few occasions where the Pharisees counted their own interpretation of Scripture as dogma. See, they tried to explain away where it says, um, you shall not commit adultery. Um, he, they tried to explain away, um, you shouldn't divorce your wife. And so there are three things that we're going to look at where the Pharisees, and we oftentimes, blur these lines. We're going to look at authority, adultery, and abandonment. These are the three areas where we like to blur the lines and try to make it say what we want it to say. And so since Jesus shatters misconceptions about all of these, uh, we're going to start with um, the authority of Scripture. We're going to see what Jesus has said about that. So look at that first part, Matthew uh, 5, 27. The first part of that verse says, You have heard that it was said. Now Jesus is speaking to a multitude of his disciples, and he knows that there are um, there are Judaizers present. There are Pharisees present. Now, the Pharisees, they had something going for them, right? Because Jesus said, you have heard that it was said. So he acknowledges that these people know their Bibles. See, some of the, uh, to, to be part of the Sanhedrin, you even had to memorize the entire Pentateuch. That's the first five books of the Bible, to be part of the Sanhedrin. Every Hebrew word of Leviticus, you think about that. We don't even like to read it in English. And they memorized every word of Leviticus. I couldn't even do that, much less the other four. You just imagine that. So these guys knew what the word said. They could quote it, but did they know what it meant? Did they know the implications it had on their lives? But here's the thing, they at least had a starting point. They knew what the Bible said. They knew what their scripture said. Can you say the same? Are you familiar enough with the word of God that if Jesus were to, if Jesus were to come and sit right in front of you and say, hey, I said this, could you say, oh yeah, I, I remember you saying that. Or would you be like, Jesus, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, some people... Um, some of you I've, I've gotten to see outside of a church context, and I always feel so embarrassed because sometimes, sometimes, I have trouble remembering your name. This happens. This happens because I, I, we as pastors, we get to meet a lot of people, but guess what? It's still not an excuse. But we know uh, what it's like when we've got that person that comes up and they say, hey, how are you, Pastor Travis? I'm like, hey, I'm great, man. And, and you, you, just, you're, you can think of that person's circumstances. You can think about all kinds of other stuff about that person. But I have trouble remembering a name sometimes. And there's a, there's a blog that I wrote a while back about how I can remember someone's shoes better than I can remember their name. Because if I've bent down to pray with them, I can remember what their shoes look like. And I know their circumstances, but I may not be able to remember their name. So if Jesus himself came to you and said, hey, do you remember me saying this? Would we be able to say, yeah, I remember that. I, I remember reading that, Jesus. I would say, I would venture to say that most of us, myself included, most of us, would have to say, Jesus, you're, you're going to have to help me with that one. You're going to have to remind me of what this is. So see, even the Pharisees had a starting point that some of us may not have because we've taken our Bible for granted. So before we even get into what Jesus is saying about lust and adultery and divorce, we have to start out with, well, what do you do with your love letters? What do you do with this, this series of love letters that God has written to you and he has gone through so much pain and so many people have gone through pain to deliver this word to you. People were killed so that you could have a copy of the word and it sits on a shelf collecting dust. Or it sits 
on a page in your phone that you never go to and open. See, let's get this straight. We, we don't get to choose how and when to interpret the scriptures, right? We don't get to choose that. We don't have the authority to do that. We are not allowed to read our experiences and our, what we call interpretations into the scriptures, because guess what? That's going to skew what God has actually said. And it makes the eternal word of God into something that we have made up. It turns it into something that we have twisted and contorted into what we want it to say. But we're not allowed to do that. We don't have that authority. You know why? We are not God. We don't have that authority. Let the scriptures speak for themselves. And so we know that Jesus took the Bible literally because he used its literal meaning to ward off uh, Satan's temptations in the garden, right? Jesus could have spoken new scripture into existence when he was being tempted. But guess what he did? He quoted Deuteronomy verbatim. Quoted Deuteronomy. That shows that Jesus took it literally. And, and also in this same chapter, um, verse 17 Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, listen, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus is referencing the least significant portions of what we would call the letters in scripture, but he still regards them as important. These are still life. These were just the pronunciation marks. That's all these were. But Jesus said, you know what? You need to even pay attention to those because not a bit of that is going to pass away until everything is fulfilled. So who are we to put our own words into Scripture? And, and a lot of people do that. We try to spiritualize Scripture, right? You can sit down with one verse, and there are people who, you know, you can have 16 different people in a room, and you'll have 16 different interpretations of the same passage of Scripture. That's not okay. We have to let God say what He has said. Let Him speak for Himself. I preached at a, a little country church. It's been several years ago. And this church wasn't exactly a Southern Baptist church. Um, this church didn't exactly believe the way that we believe. And, and I'm always careful whenever I go to a church of a different denomination or a different, um, a different ideological system. And um, so, so I believe I was very careful. But the, the pastor of this church, after I had finished preaching, he came up and he said, well, what this young man really meant to say was this. And he just sort of did like a little, um, little appendix onto the sermon that I had just preached, but it, was, it had nothing to do with what I had preached on. And so I was sitting there thinking, that is not what I meant to say at all, pal. Like he's, he's saying, well, what he really meant was, no, that wasn't what I meant. And you know, I, if, I, if I would have been a little less mature, I would have, I would have said something. I would be like, that's not what I said. Let, let's go back over here. Well, we do that same thing whenever we spiritualize scripture. We say, okay, well, I think it means this. Or well, he, what he really meant was, we're not allowed to do that, okay? We are not allowed to do that with the Word of God. It is too precious for us to distort. Let God speak for Himself. You imagine how God would feel if He sees us uh, just in a mode of, well, I think it means this. Nah, we can't do that. We don't have that authority. And you know, if, if, if we ever have a question about what God said, number one, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, right? The Holy Spirit is the one who inspired Scripture. Spirit, inspire. You ever see that? So he has inspired the Scripture. And so we, we already have the interpreter. We have the writer living within us. But we also have more from the writer. See, when, when we wonder what God has said, oftentimes we turn to a commentary. Um, a lot of us, like, you know, we like Matthew Henry or the Bible Knowledge Commentary or, or whatever. We like to read something that someone else has said about it. But guess what? Oftentimes we skip over the best commentary that there is, and that's God's commentary. That is the rest of his word. Why is it that we would rather seek what men have said about his scriptures rather than seeing, seeking what the rest of what God has said about a certain subject? Why would we do that? Church, if the Pharisees, 
can know their Bibles. And man, we, we give the Pharisees a lot of flack, right? If the Pharisees can know their Bibles, if their Pharisees can know what the scriptures say, if the Pharisees regard what God said as truth, we should do the exact same. We should at least start from that point. So the best interpreter of scripture is scripture. One more time. What is the best interpreter of scripture? That's right. Let God speak for himself. So when Jesus was addressing these Pharisees, he he used the phrase, you have heard that it was said. And the reason that Jesus has to kind of start from that point is because the Pharisees had already put their own meaning into what they thought the next little portion was going to mean. So uh, they they tried to explain away their sin, right? They tried to say, oh, well, that's actually not what that means. I'm actually not in sin. I'm going to move the line over here so that I'm on the good side. They tried to explain it away, but Jesus... When he started this out, he, he wouldn't allow it because of the literal interpretation of Scripture. And so as we look at what we're about to read again, as we look at what this actually says, church, let us not explain this away. Let us regard sin as sin. Can we do that? So the second, second line that tends to get blurred is what is adultery? Adultery. So you're probably thinking, well, now we can actually begin because this is what the sermon was supposed to be about all along, right? You're, you're thinking, oh, we're finally getting started. Um, but without, an, without understanding what Jesus, uh, how Jesus means for us to interpret Scripture, um, you know, we're going to try to justify why it is that we're allowed to fall into these sins, right? We'll try to move that line some more. But let's just see what Jesus says here. Take it for what it is. <clears throat> um, starting at verse 27, he says, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. There's the commandment that they and we are all familiar with. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And you're thinking, well, Jesus, you're, you're taking a little too far there, aren't you? Um, you know, I, I haven't really done anything wrong. I've just thought about it. No. Jesus said what he said. He meant what he said. He said what he meant. And we have to deal with that. We have to take that for what it is. And so the problem here is that the Pharisees believed that that you could pretty much think about that sin and think about carrying that out as long as you want, but as long as you didn't carry it out, you're okay. You know, if you wanted to uh, fantasize about someone, you could. And, you know, this has carried over into our modern culture. You want to know how many times I've heard these phrases? You can look at the menu, you just can't order. You ever heard somebody say that? You can look at the menu, you just can't order. That's adultery. Come on. Like, that's simple as that. That's adultery. Uh, you, You can go to the end of the chain and bark. You've heard that one? Have you heard that one? No? Anybody? So, so you hear these uh, sort of um, euphemisms, sort of uh, metaphors regarding how far you can go until it's sin. Well, guess what? Jesus says, if you're on the chain, you're in sin. He says, if you're looking at the menu, you're in sin. <clears throat> but these Pharisees are trying to work their way around that and, <clears throat> and justify their sin. But let me tell you why that's baloney. Um, James chapter 1, verse 14 says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Pretty straightforward, right? If you think about it, if you think about that sin, it will lead to to death. And we know this to be true because if it wasn't, then nobody would air commercials anymore, right? If, if they didn't dangle these things in front of us, we wouldn't buy it and therefore they wouldn't waste their money on a commercial. And really the only thing that keeps us from buying stuff that we see in commercials, like whenever you see that um, um, call now, but not only will you get one, you will get two. You know, whenever we see those kinds of things, the only thing that really keeps us from, from going forward with that is, man, I really don't have 1995 right now plus shipping and handling. I don't have that. I got to wait a little bit. And so, see if we have a lustful heart, oftentimes the only thing that will keep us from acting on our impulses is a lack of opportunity. So how does that, you know, just, just not having an opportunity to carry that out. If you are fantasizing about someone, some celebrity or whatever, probably the only reason that you haven't carried that out is because that celebrity hasn't shown up on your doorstep and offered you anything. You think about that. 
If you had opportunity and you've been dwelling on that sin, you will probably go through with it if the opportunity rises. So why then does opportunity matter if the intent remains the same? This is what this is really what Jesus is telling these Pharisees, contrary to what they had previously believed. They said, you can think about it all you want as long as you don't do it. Jesus says, if you're thinking about it, when the opportunity arises, you will do it. So don't even think about it because that is sinful in and of itself. It will lead to sin and sin will lead to death. You know, we, um, we, we have opportunity in our pockets, right? We have plenty of opportunity to commit adultery, to commit fornication right in our pockets, on our desktops, But we don't like to talk about that, do we? And so many married and single men and women think that, that looking at porn is harmless. Let me, tell you, let me tell you why that's baloney. So if you're single, number one, it's going to give you an unrealistic idea of, of what sex within marriage should be. You're going to have a completely skewed view of what a healthy marriage should be. And if you're married, it gives you unrealistic expectations of your spouse and so, and, and yourself, you're not going to be able to perform the way that you've seen it acted out. It's just not going to happen. Let me tell you, your sex life is not an adult film to be acted out how you direct it. Listen, it's an act of love. It's a gift from God that we have, that we have perverted into something that it shouldn't be. It's an act of love between spouses, not your right hand and your right eye. Okay? So let me, let's just look at what Jesus says about these Pharisees, because Pharisees, a lot of them were known for being peeping Toms. They were. They would, they would sneak up on situations where a couple would be intimate, and, and they would pleasure themselves. And Jesus had to address that too. So if you look at verse 29, Jesus said, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. See, Jesus is pretty serious about this. He said, even if the most important thing in the world to you is causing you to stumble, get rid of it. Leave it alone. And, you know, just thinking about these Pharisees and just this, this foul act of being peeping Toms, um, you know, they, they would you know, go toward, they would just kind of stand outside the windows. What, actually, there are, um, there are historical accounts of the Pharisees that had set the, uh, the woman caught in adultery. They had set that entire thing up, and they had actually um, it's speculated that a lot of them were watching and were carrying out sexual pleasures themselves. And, you know, that, that image would be what they would use. But so, so does that sound familiar? You know, looking at an image and getting sexual pleasure? I mean, there's a reason that it's called pornography. Uh, so, so porneia, which is where it's translated sexual immorality or fornication. That's the Greek word porneia, where we get our word pornography. I mean, the, the very word sexual immorality is in the word pornography. So if you're wondering, is pornography sexual immorality? Absolutely, that is the direct translation. Porneia meaning, uh, meaning sexual immorality and graphe meaning words or images. It's literally sexually immoral images. So how can you justify it being okay to look at pornography? I know that there are people in here struggling with that. I know that there are, and it hurts, and it's difficult to overcome. But you can do it. And, and listen, if you have looked at porn or you fantasized about a member of the, of the sex to which you're attracted, or um, when you pray and ask God, to forgiveness, ask God for forgiveness next time, uh, try calling it what it is. You ever try that? Uh, the word confess in the Bible is the Greek word homologeo, which means to say the same, to call it what it is. So if, if you are single and you've been looking at porn, you have to go to God and say, God, I'm a fornicator. I am sexually immoral, and God, I need your forgiveness. If you're married and you're falling into that temptation, you have to say, God, I'm an adulterer. I have cheated on my husband or wife. You have to call it what it is. Because you know what? That'll make you think next time before you do it. Hopefully. You have to cry out, God, I'm an adulterer. Forgive my sexual immorality. That, that'll make you want to cut it out, right? That'll make you want to stop. If your phone is causing you to stumble, 
Um, you know, one, one thing you can do, have a trusted friend set up parental controls on your phone. That way you're not looking at stuff you're not supposed to be looking at. That's one way to, you know, cut out the eye or cut off the hand. Um, you know, find the source of your temptation and do everything that you can to kill it while you're strengthening your will. Because if you're still being tempted with these things while your will is shaken, guess what? It's going to be difficult, even more and more difficult for you to overcome that temptation. And listen, if you don't have the self-control to not look at porn or to have an emotional affair with someone on Facebook, because that's a thing too. Um, lots of people like to talk to someone because they don't get to talk to their spouse that much, and then it just becomes this, this whole thing. And yeah, if, if you don't have the, the self-control to not do those things, then don't pretend like Jesus means something to you. Don't you dare take communion or raise your hands in worship when you know that, that Jesus isn't worth enough to you for, for you to deny yourself of the, the pleasure that comes from your filth. Don't act like Jesus means something to you and then you just want your own desires above what he wants for you. We're not allowed to do that. But let's continue. Let's see what else Jesus has to say to the Pharisees. Um, verse 31 Jesus said, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, let's pair this. You know, the, the best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture. Let's pair this with what Jesus said to the Pharisees later on in this very same book. Now, Matthew 19, uh, starting at verse 3. It says, and Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? They're, really, it's, it's worded in a weird way there. Um, really, how that is to be understood from the original Greek is, can we divorce our wives for any reason that we want? It wasn't saying, is there a reason that we can divorce our wives? They're saying, can we divorce our wives for any reason that we want? Just because we don't like her anymore or whatever. So Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. You hear that read at weddings all the time. And they said to him, well, what then, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, that wasn't so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. So Jesus is pretty consistent in what he's teaching, right? You, you find that more and more than where you realize that Scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. And so, so look at what he's saying here. There's no good reason for a genuine believer to put away their spouse willfully. And I know that, that there are many people in here who have been divorced, um, have had to go through that pain, or have lost a spouse. But I want to I comfort you here in just a moment. So, so both Jesus in his ministry and Apostle Paul mentioned that abandonment and you know, also abandonment through adultery will free a person and allow them to remarry. And you know, for, for those of you who have been divorced and are remarried, um, you know, if, you're, if your divorce happened because of your putting away, because you had put away your spouse, or you abandoned your spouse, or you committed adultery, or just something else, listen, there, there is grace for you. I want to start out there. There is grace for you. Don't, don't let anyone look down upon you because of, of just a past issue that there may be, whether it's your fault or the other person's fault, whatever. Listen, that is a point that, that Jesus has taken care of for you. It doesn't matter who was at fault. Jesus' blood covers that. But listen, if, if, if you are that person who did that, you know, you, there is grace. You are forgiven. If you were abandoned by your spouse or if your spouse passed away, you know, there's comfort for you. There's comfort in his scriptures. If you're remarried, don't dwell on times past for whatever reason that... Um, that you no longer had your spouse. Don't dwell on that, but be diligent in making your current marriage as God-glorifying as you can until your very final breath. 
And listen, I'm not going to get into when's a good time to divorce or when's a bad time to divorce or anything like that. Um, I, I personally believe that um, there is never a good excuse for a believer to get a divorce, ever. I believe that anything that happens in a marriage between two believers can absolutely be restored. And if, if you have been abandoned, that's a completely different thing in and of itself. If someone is, uh, has, has gone and has, you know, is living with someone else and you're still married to them, um, that you have, and, and you have been abandoned, or that person just leaves and never comes back. Um, obviously, that's no fault of your own. Um, the scriptures describe you are free to remarry. But listen, we, we have blurred the line of when it's abandonment and when it's not. We have blurred the line of, of when it's okay to divorce and when it's not. We can no longer do that. And so God requires perfection. See, Jesus says that later on in, in that chapter, in chapter 5. He says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, guess what? We're, we're not perfect, period. We will not be perfect, ever. And we know that by having sexual thoughts about a person to whom we aren't married, when we've done that, we've sinned. We know that by abandoning our spouse physically or sexually, we have sinned. That is sin. We know that even before we carry out our sinful lust, we have sinned. And all of this, Jesus is using to point us toward his redemptive plan. See, we can't achieve perfection. We can't move ourselves to the saint side of the line, and we can't move the line. That takes an act of God. Think about how your mail gets to your house. Your mail doesn't just show up at your house. Your mail gets delivered by a mail carrier, right? It gets delivered to a, by a mail carrier or to your mailbox, it gets delivered. And so Jesus delivers us. If you really want to call Jesus your deliverer, you have to acknowledge that you couldn't deliver yourself. You could not pass from death to life because Ephesians says you have been quickened by him. You have been made alive by him. You can't make yourself alive. We can't move the line and make ourselves a saint. We need Jesus to deliver us from being a sinner to a saint. And that doesn't mean that we'll never sin again. See, that's what the Pharisees were trying to do. They were trying to pretend like, oh, well, we're not actually sinning anymore. They just moved all of the lines and moved all the boundaries to say, oh, well, no, we're good, we're okay. That's not to say that we'll never sin again, and, and we'd have to move the line pretty far to say that. Um, but we must acknowledge that the only way that we can be good is through the blood of Jesus and his cleansing. His blood that was shed so that ours would continue to run through our veins. And when Jesus rose from the dead and proved his deity, when he proved that he is God, not only did he prove his power over death, but he proved that he is the only one with the power over life. He is the only one who is able to give life. So I implore you to submit your life to him. Do what he has said. Do what he has asked. What does Jesus ask us to do? Well, number one, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are his two great commandments. And he said, on these hang all of the law and the prophets. So the entire law that these Pharisees had to remember hangs on those two things. That's what Jesus is commanding us to do. So we need to submit our life to him, deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. Deny yourself the temporary pleasure that is within your sin. Whether it is looking at someone to which you're attracted that you're not married to, or whether it is um, going on websites that you shouldn't be going on, or looking in books that you shouldn't be looking in, or not fulfilling your, um, your duty as a husband or wife. Whatever the case may be, you've got to deny yourself the temporary pleasure of sin, and prepare yourself to die for his fame. Be okay with that. Say, you know what? If my faith takes me to a grave, I'm okay with that. 
That's how you deny yourself and pick up your cross. We have to be willing to follow him in martyrdom if that's what it takes. Jesus died a gruesome, horrific death so that he could pay for the sin that you commit every time that you look at someone with lustful intent. You think about that. That's why he died. He died because we, we have trouble. We, we lack the self-control to keep from doing things like that. He died because we are sinful people and he wanted to redeem us so that he could have a relationship with you and with me. And I've said this so many times before. I absolutely love my daughter. I love my Josie. She's my pride and joy. Would I ever be able to see her killed in a gruesome way to pay for something that you did? Probably not. You know why? I'm not God. But that's exactly what he did. He sent his son, whom he loved, with whom he was well pleased. He sent him to die for someone who had wronged him. That's you. That's me. So as the band comes back up, I'd like to just say that that we have to stop blurring these lines. We have to stop with trying to read something into Scripture that isn't actually there or trying to um, take something out of Scripture and dodge something. We have to stop that. We have to no longer blur the line with what adultery is. We have to acknowledge when we are committing it. We have to say the same. We have to tell God when it is that we're committing adultery. And we have to acknowledge that God does hate divorce, but he has redeemed us and he has made restoration. And so listen, if if there are questions that come up um, because of this sermon, I I welcome you to go on our app. You can ask questions that way. Uh, We'd be glad to answer them. However, we can either here at church or in person with you or on a podcast, uh, we will answer your questions. Because I know that this is a difficult subject and it causes a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. Um, but listen, we are, we are here. Your pastors want to help you. Um, but listen, if you are here and you haven't submitted your life unto Christ, if you haven't said, you know what, Jesus, you did all that for me. I want to give my entire life to you. I urge you, please don't leave here without considering that. Don't leave here without talking to, to myself or someone at the green tent just about what it means to be a follower of Christ. Please don't let that slip by. Talk to one of us about it. But for now, I want us all to stand. We're going to prepare our hearts to worship the Lord because he's worthy. And even when everything in our world has shaken, he is still our solid rock. He is still always there. He is, we are his bride and he is our groom. We never have to worry about him leaving us or forsaking us.